So, hello, I'm thrilled to introduce, um, well, Esther Syam, whom I saw speaking yesterday, actually, and who said that she started writing because her grandmother would tell her stories. So it's unsurprising then that her work largely deals with the importance of storytelling and of oral narratives. And these themes are reflected in her, frankly, devastatingly beautiful poems um, and her plays. Uh, and if I may say, I was reading some of your poetry yesterday and I also picked up on a lot of feminist themes, which I thought were absolutely stunning. So, um, and uh, also dealing with the shared myths and folklore uh, of, <clears throat> of the Northeast. And Esther is, among other things, the Professor of English Studies at Northeastern Hill University in Shillong. Um, and with her, we have uh, Kayani Sehmad, who's the author of Good Night, Mr. Kissinger. That was his collection of short stories. He's the publisher of the Dhaka Tribune and the co-founder of Bengal Lights, which is a prominent literary magazine um, in Bangladesh. And um, his first novel, The World in My Hands, uh, is to my mind at least a sort of modern Faustus uh, in which, well, <laughs> in which a choice has to be made. It, it's one of those stories about sort of, you know, every man having a price and what might that price be. And so we find ourselves in a place rather like Bangladesh, where a military-backed emergency has taken place, giving a newspaper editor the opportunity to live out his wildest fantasies, as long as he's willing to pay the price. So I leave you with these two. Thank you. And Can you hear me? Is this on? OK. Um, so Esther and I decided that I would read first and then Esther would read. We would each read for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'd love to take questions from you if there are any questions or if you just want us to read some more, we'll do that too. Um, it's kind of funny sitting here trying to read from my book because my book deals with a state of emergency. There's a newspaper editor and his best friend who's a, a real estate tycoon. Uh, they're both faced with different uh, temptations and threats in this time of uh, change and abnormality. Uh, they happen to be in love with the same woman, but one of them is also in love with two different women. Uh, so all these situations you know, unfold. Uh, being a state of emergency, being the kind of people that these people are, uh, you know, there's also the inevitable situations of arrest or detention and questioning. And it's kind of funny to be sitting here with these lights glaring straight into my eyes. You know, it's, uh, it's like a uh, slightly evocative of uh, scenes that transpire in the book. Uh, but luckily, I think if I look down, then I can read just fine. I'll read from the very opening of my novel, because it'll give you an idea of the main character and of also the strange kind of times in which the story begins to unspool. I'll read the very opening paragraph and then go uh, skip ahead a little in the first chapter to a particular scene. All great success, like all true failure, is ultimately a thing of mystery. One discovers principles and causalities post facto. One imposes order and progressions on the most spectacular of fates and detects patterns that may or may not exist. Here was the formula that anyone could follow to execute a meteoric rise. Believe in yourself, wake with the dawn, never give up, make a daily list, aim big, be a maverick. Hissam Habib, deputy editor of the Daily Pandua, man of letters with a pungent wit, a deep-seated deep heresies, and also a possessor of ambitions as huge and hidden as his anxieties, knew it all. He had, in fact, tried it all. Lately, he had acquired a taste for tracts of self-improvement the power of yes, how to get to the top and stay there, only the paranoid survive. These books were of course never displayed. The walls of Hassam's library were girded with great books, while his office was stacked with the dreariest form of all literature, think tank reports on development from around the world. Everything he owned, he had actually read. In his youth, he truly believed in the significant branches of knowledge, albeit with a partiality to philosophy and literature, and a respectable nod to history and the sciences. 
If those subjects contained any answers though, they were revealed with excruciating slowness and indirection. And that was a luxury for which he felt he no longer had the time. Hence, his recent reliance on self-help manuals, this cachet of secret wisdom, along with his talk of Rogaine and classic pornography in the vernacular, he kept hidden in his bedroom. So that's uh, Hizam Habib, the aspiring uh, editor. And as the novel unfolds, we're 10 days into a state of emergency, and he is rushing to an important meeting uh, with the director of a powerful intelligence agency. And uh, he's already running late, and uh, the curfew hour is about to start. So all of this is making him uh, uh, both hasty and anxious. And as they're going, he's asked his driver to go quickly so that they can get there on time. And the driver uh, sort of screeches to a halt to avoid running over a dog. And Hissam, who was sort of in a nice reverie of his own, is snapped out of it and says, God damn it, which, watch where you go, Moti. Hissam shouted at his driver, annoyed to be snapped out of his thoughts. Empty roads make you so restless. Bloody dogs have no curfew, boss, responded Moti, Hissam's indomitable chauffeur of many years. But before he could release the brake, a soldier stepped forward from the side of the street and waved at them to stop. Now look what you've done, Hissam grumbled under his breath. The soldiers sauntered over to their car with the universal gait of all men with a gun slung over their shoulders, deliberately slow and with just a hint of swagger to signal their authority. The soldiers' companions, muffled in sweaters for a long night of vigil, watched them silently from their wooden bench on the sidewalk. The soldier, looking more equipped in a multi-pocketed khaki jacket, walked up to the passenger side and tapped on the front window for Moti to roll it down. Before Moti could respond, Hissam rolled down his backseat window, shoved out the curfew pass he had secured earlier that week from the BNI, and declared his identity in a hoarse voice. The soldier ignored the papers and identity offered by his prey. Clearly, the soldier, a dull-eyed young man with a thin and austere face, hardened from years of beatings, presumably first from his father and then in the army, did not wish to have his plenipotence denied so easily especially now that he had taken the trouble to saunter over from his makeshift station. License, the soldier said. Don't make any smart aleck comments, his hum instructed Moti in a barely audible whisper. Moti fumbled in his pockets. If they behaved and the papers were in order, they would be allowed to pass with nothing more than a few rough words. But he sweated. If Moti succumbed to his deep-seated need to be witty or defiant, then they would be pulled over to the corner where the soldier's posse waited. Blue book, said the soldier, not happy to find the license valid. Excuse me, Hissam said again, mustering all his courage and authority. I have a meeting with the Brigadier Bakhtiar, director of the BNI. Do you want me to run late for a meeting with the BNI? Two cars passed by at a perfect 35 miles per hour in an ostentatious display of law-abiding behavior. The soldier did not look at Hissam, even though he was now forced to pause and consider his course of action. He looked up. At the road ahead, his jaws clenched, patently displeased to have the BNI invoked in the middle of this transaction. Hissam knew this was a bit of a gambit. Most soldiers would not risk harassing anyone who made a credible claim of acquaintance with the director of the BNI. But an emergency socially elevated all persons in uniform by at least two ranks. Majors acted like colonels, colonels like generals, and generals like gods. Thank you. Hear me. Um, actually, I'd like to begin my reading this evening by telling you about uh, what happens to me when I come out of my state. People think that I don't uh, live in India. And, uh, you know, I was asked for my passport three times. Now, it's very amusing to me because this is something that happens to many of us. And um, uh, so I've written a poem in response to that. And I would like to begin the session with this particular poem. It's, uh, it's an unpublished poem. It's called To the Rest of India from Another Indian. Um, 
we have no ram no sita no arjuna ours are differently named no wars were fought on grounds in kurukshetra and lanka ours were in camouflage up the stony tracks of the antelope down impossible ravines and through impassable jungles we've no temples none to be purified with litanies and incense to leave in crimes of the night no one river too sacred to purify impurities none of our gods bear god names like yours but if you should twist your tongues around ours as we learned to twist ours around yours you'll get a taste of webbed legends earth gods and sky deities nymphs and elfin dwarfs that winnow souls and scale bamboo leaves rinsed intestines in running streams icons that died for a love that endorsed a freedom uninhibited as our wild mountain herbs lom shalong and sajer nangli and how we swallowed our written script stones that eat and rivers that fly talking tigers and tiger men an itchy monster itching to be scratched a rebellious a rebellious stag pounding for freedom and the inconsolable dirge of a mother is nam still alive and the tiger and the toad are our sibling mountain gods still at war with each other and our translucent caves let me tell you that rig in our underground worlds stitch in the ancestor who sanctified the speaking tongue would you then even care to enter tongue twistingly into the spoils of our speaking wealth thank you um, well i'll um, i think i'll uh, i'll read out a few this is a particular poem that um, has to do with the moon you know and um, i think um, people have always uh, many civilizations have looked upon the moon as being someone something that uh, you know the moon is associated mm. with um, well with something good but uh, in our culture the moon was uh, supposed to have incestuous relation incestuous feelings towards his own sister the sun and uh, it was during a particular dance that he was dancing with the sun and he tr he tried to um, he tried to um, uh, grapple with her and uh, she took hot ash and threw it on his forehead which is the reason why the moon is supposed to have you know that ashy look uh, when you look at the moon now this is called the incestuous moon the ash that marks me confines me to my shame and weaves images of sordid des desires that casts me in roles of cataclysmic shame and i am trapped in these roles gray dust on my forehead ashy imprint grooved in my countenance forces me to withdraw into the shadow of sunless darkness to give light by default and to live in the coldness of night endless orbiting around the an earth which caught me branded me and flung me away in my far flung seclusion i hear the percussions of their evil frenzied incantations chants that camouflage their guilt rituals that obliterate their shame as they reenact my very roles in my twilight hemisphere of gray distinctions i orbit alone consigned to my space a symbol of lust exorbitant the price i pay thank you should i take another one Would you like to do something? No? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, of, yeah. uh, th I'll read out another one, which I think um, affects all of us in India, which is the kind of mining that's going on uh, all over the country. It's called Welcome to Jaintia Hills. Now, Jaintia Hills is a place in the eastern part of Meghalaya, and the country is completely ravaged. by the kind of coal mining and limestone mining that goes on and uh, you know the the river that flows through it the lukha river every year turns into a metallic blue because it is so 
are polluted and uh, the fish, you know, they, they, they come to the surface and they all die. Uh, this is um, a poem about that. It's called Welcome to Jaintia Hills. As you drive further east on the tarred road that runs through the pine-scented woods of the easterly longitudes of this temperate country, you will reach the end, which is also the beginning of a recent demarcation where the grandiose arbor of Topsem cement, this, these, these are one of the many uh, cement factories that we have there, where the, gr the grandiose arbor of Topsem cement awaits to take you in with open arms to welcome you to the Jaintia Hills of Mines Returns. That's strewn with cement factories, limestone quarries, and rat holes into coal streams, into coal seams, a vulgaris mix of laborers and migrants and denizens, migrants turned laborers, laborers turned denizens, denizens turned citizens, citizens in turn turned migrants who jostle continuously for more elbow room and shoving, shoveling place in the dank and sweaty trading spaces of what was once the speaking forests of our mighty clans, from where the great primeval migrations to our western lands took place, with their subsequent histories following, that sheltered restless creatures within the foliage of its undergrowth through the seasons of the year, also sparkling fish in the Luka. before it recently turned a metallic cobalt blue that powered the speaking rhythms of our soul in clear, transparent voice to stay the rain, call forth the sun. These once struck awe in our ancestors, forest dwellers, villagers, who in one generation turned strangers from the land, in two turned a promiscuous citizenry, raucous, in commandeering all the spoils of the land. That was lovely. Um, so we thought we would also be open to any questions you have, or we can read some more and then open up to questions. Any preference? Maybe we'll read, uh, read some more and then, yeah, OK. OK, so in my novel, it's actually told from three points of view. The two friends who are now um, on opposite sides of a new political divide, Hassam the journalist and Kaiser the real estate tycoon. The third point of view is Kaiser's wife. And she's kind of the heroine of the novel. And um, if, if I sh should confess such a thing, actually my favorite character. So I'll uh, read something uh, to do with her. It's sort of middle of the story and things have become very tough for Kaiser and Natasha. They're facing a lot of political pressures. Kaiser is at risk of perhaps being arrested at any moment and they approach this religious holiday which has always meant something to Natasha. So it's a little moment from uh, uh, that point in, in this emergency and also a glimpse into the sort of deeply personal small scale uh, life that still goes on even as this macro uh, disorder is uh, there as a backdrop. Of all the religious holidays in Pandua, Natasha's favorite ever since childhood was shab -e barat the night of fortune. It was the night when the souls of ancestors descended from the heavens to bless the pure of heart. With the benediction of unseen souls, one's fate for the coming year would be written. Even sinners could get a reprieve from punishment by praying all night for forgiveness. Believers, even the less diligent kind, would roll out their prayer mats, their hearts a flutter with, with hope. As a child, Natasha didn't care too much for the prayer or its import. She reveled in the halwas cooked on this occasion, and even more, in the ritual of distributing them to one's neighbors. In her father's house, the bustle began early. Her grandmother rose before dawn to start the process. She was helped by her two maid servants and joined by assorted relatives and neighbors. According to Natasha's mother, the other ladies trundled over mainly to steal the grandmother's recipes. The ingredients were there for all to see. Ghee and chickpeas, almonds and eggs, cinnamon and pistachio. Yet no one else could quite replicate her grandmother's wizardry. As a girl, Natasha believed her grandmother to be a benevolent witch who applied secrets and potions when no one was looking. 
and thus bested her admiring peers year after year. When the halwas were finally presented to the family, her grandfather ceremonially sampled a bite from each, nut and carrot, egg and chickpea, almond and tapioca, and her grandmother's most divinely inimitable creation, the nishista. Her grandmother did not succumb to exclamations. Her, her grandfather did not succumb to exclamations. His appreciation was expressed in a bright but controlled smile, and her grandmother, too, received the adulation in silence. Through the day-long preparations, through the inaugural tasting, Natasha waited only to begin the delivery of the halwas. Excited to wear her new kameez, she wanted most of all to show off her grandmother's superior treats and be gratified by the looks on neighbors' faces of wonder and envy, gratitude and delight. Her, brother, her brothers, much older, were assigned to deliver parcels to the more distant parts of the city. But the immediate neighborhood belonged to Natasha and cousins her age, who traveled to the grandparents' for the religious holidays. What she remembered best all these years later was the time when the power failed and while they were still in the middle of their rounds, and while they were still in the middle of their rounds, the streets and houses fell into total darkness, and then one by one, trays of candles began to glow all around the neighborhood. The windows offered the meek glow of kerosene lamps behind thin curtains. On that dark stage, as she watched a parade of flickering lights weave a gentle and ever so slightly unpredictable pattern, the muni pattern, the munificent presence of ancient souls seemed entirely believable. Okay. Need one more? As I said yesterday, you know, when I was placed with Anis, and I find it very interesting because for the Kasis living in Meghalaya, we've had a very close relationship with the people that is now called Bangladesh, but we refer to them as Banglas. And I have a series of poems called Border Narrations, but I shall read only one. And uh, it talks about the presence of the army uh, in the borders. And uh, of course, we have, I have three, but I'll not read all three. Uh, it's called Bordar narrations. You know, in Khasi, people cannot pronounce border, so it's Bordar. Uh, bordar narrations. Uh, you know, so you have the voice of the, you have the voice of the, the here it's the voice of the army officer. Sunyar, this is Hindi, I think you can make out. Take a deep swig, you'll need it to keep yourself awake and warm. Don't forget that they're at the borders, guarding the borders of India from Bangladesh. Okay, where, where uh, all the time it's the people from the Khasi Hills and the Banglas, you know, we manage to cross over and sort of, you know, enter each other's houses. Take a deep swig, you'll need it to keep yourself awake and warm while the night's still young. Sachi hai, truly you're a tenderfoot all right with your attention to boring details and your devotion to duty. Sun, don't kid yourself, yaar, and create trouble for all of us here. Don't you know? It's every man for himself out here. Only leftovers of our mother India, yaar. Or should you learn the tricks of our other trades in your line of duty, then shabash, yaar. These are only the few words that I know in Hindi. You've served yourself well, bhai. Koi baat nahi if your family is not here. The sirens are waiting, yaar. No matter that you're here, in a place as far away from your clan as God is from man. Beta, you might as well know you might as well live like one of us here. Live well like all of us here, yaar. We're disciplined men, all alert, on call, on duty. Now that we've earned our creature comforts here in these climes, we refuse the transfer to mainland India, yaar, only till such time that we choose to claim it. Soon, yaar, we draw our own lines, official lines notwithstanding, for we have to know for our own sake and our own survival Who's within our side? Who's within their side? Whoever's pagal enough to be caught inside of ours or inside of theirs is dead meat on this side of our side and on that side of their side. When lines are sneakingly crossed at night, usually at night, then it's a body count, tamasha, young dost. Are, don't look so shocked, yaar. Are high ups, you ask? We take care of them. So they'll know what to answer to the rest of India. Theirs will, we know. And we carry on as ever before. Koi baat nahi yaar, with our barter and our trade and our inside partners and our outside partners on this side of ours and on that side of theirs. Beta, 
You must know that we claim no responsibility for unaccounted debts. There's no profit in that, Yar. Thank you. Excellent. This is a border call. Open to questions, if, if there's any. Uh, well, thank you very much. And for those very different, I mean, actually similar themes, but in very different sort of spaces. And, you know, the urban gritty injustice, uh, you know, versus uh, your, you know, your sort of set in, in Meghalaya, and, you know, in an entirely different, yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, so are there, I'm so sorry, I, oh God, you're quite right about the light situation, I can't see anything. Um, are there any, all oh right. Uh, my question is to ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't hello. hear you. It's fine. Sorry, we can't hear hello. you. Hello, fine. Hello. Yeah, uh, in no Northeast, uh, we have uh, lots of tribes, and while doing their everyday works, they sing like uh, songs in a very low voice, and they have like a hymns to them. But they, they don't particularly have some words for the songs that they sing. I don't. Uh, Hello. Could you repeat yourself, please? Okay. Hello. In Northeast, I have listened to many uh, peasants working and s singing some songs. Primarily, what I get is they have hymns and tunes to them, but they may or may not have words to it. They may, know, uh, may or may not have words. words. Words to it, or I am unable to understand them. I think uh, the songs have words. Right. Yes, and uh, uh, as I said yesterday, we are an oral community. Right. So there's a lot of singing and chanting. Right. So, so is there some uh, po uh, poet from Northeast uh, who can like bring words to those songs in a more you know, uh, easy for a layman to understand their thoughts? Yes, it's quite easy to understand. All we need is translations. Yeah. Some easy, so is there some Northeast writer doing it? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, this organization in Delhi has also come there to uh, translate. Uh, I think this is work that a number of us are also involved, you know, we involve ourselves in doing it, translating it and r collecting it and documenting it, writing it in our own languages and trying to uh, bring it to the rest of the world. There is work being done. Uh, hi, I would like to ask one question uh, regarding your last poem, which has uh, some Hindi words to it, like beta, yar, san, yeah. So, what made you to do that experiment with uh, this? You see, the thing is, we have a heavy pre presence of the military there, you know, uh, and uh, we do listen, we do hear uh, these kind of words being spoken. And I also have a brother-in-law who was in the army. And uh, I've listened to him talk. It's a very rough kind of talk sometimes. So I caught on to some of these phrases and I put them together. And that's how the inspiration for my poetry came. Uh, my question is for Anise. Um, so this is your first novel. And as a writer, what was the difference between writing short stories and moving to a novel? In short, it was a lot harder. <laughs> Because the short stories, uh, I, the collection had nine stories which I wrote over a period of time. And I found with the short stories, especially with the shorter short stories, that they could be written as it were on a strong inspiration over the process of a weekend or a long weekend or a week. Uh, you could put together the basic outline or the basic narrative. And then you took a bit more time to flesh it out and edit it. And you know, as long as you could have a few days of relative quiet and, and a strong inspiration, you could get a story finished. Um, in the early stages of writing the novel, trying to write chapters in, in, in that mode, uh, uh, 
taught me that uh, it would take an inordinately long time to finish the book if I uh, stayed in that mode. And also that uh, the story loses a certain sort of coherence and continuity if there isn't a, a different kind of uh, organization. So I think in writing a novel, uh, I, I definitely had to get much more organized, uh, get a sense of an outline. And it changed as the writing progressed. You know, there's no sense of the ending that's fixed from the beginning. But at any given moment, you needed to have a sense of where it's going. And then also you were surprised by how it took turns and went somewhere else. Uh, so this is called The World in Our Hand. Um, and I know, Anise, your novel is called The World in My Hand. So um, first, for Anise, why did you call your novel that? And second, for Esther, um, in what sense uh, do you think you fit into that title, The World in Our Hands? And what, what world are you speaking of? Is it just the Kasi world, or is it the, the greater world? I'll, I'll just talk about the title. Uh, for me, the, uh, it was a sort of deliberate double entendre with the world in my hands. It's both uh, the extreme ambition of some of my characters as if um, they could possess or that they wanted to possess the world in its entirety, the, that kind of largeness of ambition, that kind of uh, uh, audacity. But on the other hand, it also has the other meaning that it is about each character and whatever small portion of the world that is actually in their hands and, and it's in their care and it is theirs to nurture or theirs to lose. So, and the story visits both aspects of, you know, trying to get the entire world and sometimes you lose what's in your hands. Actually, I think uh, the one answer I can give you about that is that the world is not in our hands, which is the reason why we're trying so much to speak out in the Northeast. And if you read uh, one of the introductions uh, to one of the um, uh, Ro uh, Robin Gangom, a very uh, well-known uh, Manipuri poet, he talks about the art of witness. And so when you realize that the world is not in your hands, it's being taken away from you, the only thing you can do is witness what you've seen. And I think this is something we've taken on, many of us as writers have taken on almost as a sacred duty to ourselves, to our uh, people, to the world at large. You know, I actually have a quick question for Esther uh, and, and uh, listening to you yesterday and, and first of all I apologize for my ignorance but I, I'm under the impression that in the Northeast uh, the Assamese write in uh, Assamese which also has its own script and, and uh, body of literature and some of them also write in English uh, whereas in many of the other states and uh, among other ethnic groups I think a lot of writing is done in English. I'm not aware if uh, there is a, a sort of large body of written literature in the other languages in their own tongue. I mean, they of course have their own very rich oral traditions. So first of all, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. And say in case of Meghalaya, I mean, is there a written tradition in the vernacular? Or if there isn't, how does that play into everything? In fact, I think there are very few uh, English writers in the Northeast, okay. uh, just a few of us. Uh, there is the, um, the vernacular, if you call it, the, the language is being taught in, uh, it, it comes up to the university level, but don't forget that if we talk about Meghalaya, we must also think of Nagaland and, um, Nagaland and Mizoram. And uh, what is happening in some cases in Nagaland is that the language has to be taught to the people because the people are speaking in another language, which is the Nagamese, which is the link language between all the different tribes. And very little is being written as yet. Okay. And uh, perhaps for many of us, I, I write in Khasi and in English. And uh, in writing in English, I'm also hoping to communicate to the, to the rest of the world. But I also right. try to translate into Khasi. Okay. Great. I think there's a hand in the back. Actually, uh, nowadays we can see many languages are spoken around us. So it can be like, uh, uh, it will affect our generation uh, according to like, uh, how much percent or how much it will affect our generation, the different type of languages. No, I think it's for you. Can you just, is it for? 
like uh, nowadays uh, many uh, languages are spoken around us so how much if it will affect our generation i think there's a lot of language loss nowadays which is why you find that many communities are especially being very concerned that their languages should be uh, the languages should be saved and uh, if you have kept um, you know if you looked at the news you find that professor ganesh devi has also headed this move well not a movement but attempt to document all the languages and you know in the northeast there is a community where there are only four speakers left it's called the chibok variety of uh, in garo hills and there's another uh, the darang language where there are only 200 speakers and these are languages which have never seen the light of day they've never been written down because they never had a script you know so so in the northeast you have this diversity of languages you know i find the idea of disappearing languages so poignant uh, but also especially in some extreme case where there's only four speakers left one would hope that at least their speech is being recorded as a, as a kind of this, sign yeah this was what was being done recently in okay. the plsi also but, i don't know if uh, i mean you must be aware of uh, the uh, you know great uh, example of ngugi wa thiongo who or the kenyan writer he started out writing in english and then made a deliberate choice to go back to his native language uh, gikuyu and he sort of created as it were a body of writing and literature where one didn't exist before and sounds like something that would be uh, could be of interest to some young writer from the northeast where the languages are especially under a certain kind of threat i think this is something that uh, everybody is aware of in the northeast that they have to conserve their language and uh, it's a in fact it's a day to day attempt you know yeah. to to document to conserve it to keep it alive and yeah it's it's an issue very close to our hearts both in bangladesh and uh, for me in connection to our journal bengal lights because bangladesh you know famously in 1952 fought for the right of its language right. when the pakistanis tried to impose urdu as the national language and uh, that eventually blossomed into what became our liberation uh, a uh, movement and eventually liberation war and now it's an independent country but in our turn i'm i'm sort of sorry and ashamed to say that uh, in the early years we were not uh, sensitive and respectful enough to the plight of other people who lived in our lands and arguably many of them for far longer than some of us were living there and we were not very mindful of their right to their languages uh, we have uh, smaller ethnic communities like the chakmas and the uh, we also have garos and there, khasis and we have 90000 there are about 90000 khasis in bangladesh yeah. uh, and chantals and so on and what is interesting is that these families send their uh, boys to school in dhaka and their girls to india mm -hmm. i don't know why it is but that's what they do interesting so that's why this relationship with bangla is something that has you know we've had it through the generations really. but uh, lately you know um, february 21st the day of the bangladesh bangla uh, language movement has been recognized by the united nations as the international mother language day and we at bengal lights have sort of taken that as a sign and reminder to be equally celebratory of all languages in our midst so we sort of taken extra trouble like every february traditionally in bangladesh everybody looks at bangla language literature and so on but we always try to also look at these other languages and either traditional oral poems which have now been transcribed but also contemporary writers what they're saying in their own language now it, with the translation of course because um other, otherwise people would not be able to understand or, or majority of readers would not so i i think this issue of language is vital and and one that's definitely very rewarding to engage with um is it your experience as it has been with mine uh, for for both of you that um speakers of smaller languages are not very keen for their children necessarily to learn those smaller languages because they are not the languages of empowerment you want to take it first okay oh, well um you know you have to understand that we live in a country where there is, there is this big divide between city and village and if you look at city folks uh this whole thing about globalization and the job market is very important which is why you find that in the northeast if you look at many folks uh, people living in the cities english has become very important hindi is hardly spoken 
Nobody can speak Hindi, unless, of course, we talk about the bazaar Hindi. But if you go into the villages, I think the best conservation of languages is being done in the villages, because they're closer to the earth, they're closer to nature, and uh, they, have, they don't live uh, divorced from nature in the way that city people do, and that's where the language is also nurtured and conserved. So I really don't uh, think that the languages are lost, unless, of course, there's this migration that is taking place that you know, brings people to the city. Then they lose touch with their roots, which lies in the language they speak. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, the experience is a little different in, in that Bengali is not a small language. It is, I believe, the sixth most uh, populous language in the world. And yet, even among uh, Bengali speakers in Bangladesh now, you know, despite our history of uh, fighting for the language and all that, there is definitely a tremendous interest in uh, parents sending their kids to what are called English medium schools. And once upon a time, that used to be the practice of, if not the elite, then sort of, uh, you know, fairly prosperous uh, city folk, whereas now English medium schools are opening up in small towns and, and even further inland. And I think, you know, it, it'd be kind of unfair of us, those who grew up in cities and uh, had a more, quote, natural uh, access to the language or, or ways of acquiring it as part of our uh, uh, daily lives, uh, for us to sort of sit and say, oh, you know, I can uh, speak English and I get to go to Jaipur and someone else must <laughs> be the custodian of Bengali and sit in their village. Uh, far be it for me to say that. I think. Uh, everyone has the right to learn whatever languages they feel will make them competitive in the world, economically and otherwise, within their own national boundaries and beyond. But it also doesn't have to be an issue of that to learn one, you have to forget or give up the other. In my personal case, someone who writes in English in the subcontinent context, I actually went to a Bengali medium school for 12 years, and I feel that that has actually enriched my experience and connection to the culture in ways that's... Uh, that at least my friends who write in English without that kind of uh, access, you know, sometimes uh, complain about. They, 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 now that they're much older, they sometimes wish that they had that, uh, whatever you want to call it, deeper or easier access to the local literature and culture. So I, I think there's something there that's definitely, when you're a teenager, you're not very keen on it, but that was one thing I'm very grateful that uh, was somehow given to me. And I had a love of languages, so I was happy to be learning both Bangla and English. And I think a lot of times when people are older, they still make an effort then to get back to the language. Could I just say something, please? Uh, it's very interesting that in the history of the Khasi language, we began with the translation in, Bing uh, in translation using the Bengali script because we, had, we, didn't have, we don't have a script. Of course, that's another story. We used uh, the Bengali, um, uh, Bengali, char Bengali alphabets yeah. or characters. What are they called? Yeah. But uh, it seemed that... Uh, uh, they couldn't be fitted into the Khasi way of speaking, which is why we shifted to the Roman script. Otherwise, we'd be writing in Bengali. <laughs> Great. Uh, my question is to Esther. Some of it has already transpired, but uh, I know um, like it's the Roman script that is being used by the Khasis, and is it also by the Nagas and... Lusha? Many of the hill communities. The hill communities, yes. right. Now, I find, um, although you're saying like our mother lang, uh, lang, uh, tongue was Bengali and we uh, fought for that language. So you're saying like in the villages, the Khasi language and all is being preserved and it's more. Because the town, as I know, has a strong influence of English. Yes. Because there are very many good English schools that were run by the missionaries. Okay, And in uh, Shillong, uh, all over India, the Shillong Choir is very famous. Yes, yes, it's yes. very good. Now, they are practicing the Western songs and sometimes the Hindi, Bollywood that I'm seeing. What about your Khasi songs? Are they equally being, you know, because we, a song is a medium through which your language can be. But I find the, we get more of the Western songs from the, uh, even in the young days. The Khasis are very interested in the Western music. Uh, that's a very uh, important question because um, what is, what we do have a lot of local musicians, a lot of local music, but I think uh, they have to learn to market themselves in the way that the Shillong Chamber Choir has been able to do it, you know, for, uh, for some kind of recognition outside its own region. But we do have a very rich tradition, especially the drums, you know, the drummers that we have there, yes, 
has a very rich uh, history, a very rich tradition. Um, uh, Ma'am, recently in India, we are seeing this whole uh, Simandara Telangana issue. And uh, so, do you think that it is justified dividing people on the basis of language rather than bringing them together? Definitely not. I don't think one ought to divide people on the basis of language. I mean, look what it's done to our country. States being divided on linguistic lines, which is why I kept talking when I was talking to Anis since yesterday. I felt, I don't know why, but I felt very close to him. And later I knew, and later I learned that his mother was my senior in school. But I felt very close to him. He's a Bengali and I'm a Khasi, but there's been so much exchange between Bengalis and Khasis. Trade carried on between the, the Khasis. I have a poem on that also. But you know, we would export oranges to them and we'd get the dry fish from them. And the dry fish that we eat is a definite influence on Bengalis. So how, how can you say that uh, language divides? I think uh, we've also learned a lot of, we're using a lot of words, Bengali words, and I'm sure a lot of Khasi words have crossed over to Bengal, I mean to the, the Bengalis uh, living in the borders. So I think we have to um, nurture what is ours and, he and, and that should teach us to, to, to understand that we are living in a country which is so diverse and yet it is so rich. That is something which is important. Ma'am, uh, what are the other things other than language that helps to put the world into our hands? That helps people to? That help us to put the world into our hands. I think uh, the whole, um, the, whole fa the, the, the arts and the humanities. Now, I can't talk about science in our tribal communities, but you know the arts, the ability to weave, the ability to... Um, to do what your, your forefathers have done and to be able to bring it up and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, bring it together with the things that are happening around the world. You know, so I think that's important, the ability to sing. I mean, to sing, to dance, to play, the, to, to play any instruments and then to bring them together. And you have this fantastic uh, music that we've heard these past few nights, the fusion music that's going on. I don't think we can escape that. Hi, um, I was just interested, obviously you both say that you write in English and another language, so either Khasi or Bengali. When you, um, or when an idea for a story or a poem comes to you, does it come in a particular language or does the idea come and then you decide whether to tell it in English or in another language? Uh, for me, I mean, I am really very bilingual and for me, uh, both languages, I think in both languages and I often don't know even, I'm not conscious of which language uh, I'm speaking or thinking, especially if I'm with other people who speak Bengali English both, especially at home. Uh, when I'm writing, uh, of course I'm writing in English, so the thoughts are flowing much more in English. But especially when I'm doing dialogue, I'm a lot of times imagining the dialogue as it would take place in Bangla because my characters are in that kind of a context and I know that in real life the exchange would take place in Bangla and I hear it in Bangla and I try to capture the tone and tension as it would exist in Bangla, give it as good a translation as I can. But uh, for the most part, uh, you know, as long as I'm writing in English, for me the primary uh, language of thought and, and feeling remains English, but Bangla does sleep, seep into it in, in a variety of ways that are almost uh, hard to discern or determine. Well, for me, it's very strange, you know, because I've heard the saying that you dream in the, in the, in the language that you think. I, I don't know what language I dream in. You know, I really don't know. But um, I write my poetry in English. It comes to me in English. I have to write in English. But I write my plays in Khasi. I cannot think of writing my plays in English. And I have no explanation for that. <laughs> I'm actually a bit like that. Uh, I write, is this on? I write fiction in English, but I write nonfiction in Bangla. 
And about this uh, thing that, you know, like when you dream in a language, you know that you're fluent in it. I actually had a very odd experience with that. Uh, in my student days, I really devoted myself to learning French. And uh, one summer I was in Paris and, you know, taking eight hours of French every day. And I started dreaming in French, but I wasn't fluent. Uh, I think, you know, if you spend, if you're immersed enough in something, you'll dream about it. But the fluency takes a lot of hard work and practice before you get to it. Uh, thank you. I have one small question for Anis. Uh, could you comment upon the situation with dialects in Bangladesh? Yeah, because there are obviously many dialects spoken in different countries. I somehow was exposed uh, to the knowledge about Chittagongi dialect and uh, what other dialects are there and how the preservation of them is going on there. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, in, first of all, the Bangla that is spoken in Bangladesh former East Bengal, that itself would be viewed by West Bengalis as a dialect and vice versa. Uh, in, uh, historically, all the districts of Bengal have had uh, some slightly different, some very marked and others not so marked, you know, difference from uh, other uh, uh, places and the way they spoke Bengali. Uh, the country is, you know, so sort of crisscrossed by river that I think for centuries when people were not interacting too much with people from other parts and were quite confined by different uh, regions, they evolved their own ways of speaking. Um, the people in Kushtia, Jasur region, I think, have more of a sing-song quality. And I'm not saying that because my um, ancestors are from Jasur, but that's what people say, too, that there's a kind of sweet-sounding quality to their language, whereas Noakali Chittagong sort of has a harsher sound. Chittagong and Silet has dialects that are actually almost incomprehensible to us, uh, rest of us Bangla speakers. But the rest of us can, without any problem, understand one another, although we would pick up on the local dialectal accents and uh, diction or usages uh, right away. Now, in literature, what has happened is uh, East Bengalis really started writing, and especially Bengali Muslims started writing in Bengali from the late 19th century but more voluminously from the 1920s, 30s, and so on. And initially, they were following the standard of written Bangla in Kolkata. From the 60s, and especially after independence, from in the post-70s, that has changed. The, uh, what we would call manbhasha, or standard language in Bangladesh, with its own dictionary rules, etc., is not terribly different from uh, West Bengal, but it is, you know, noticeable right away. And also, only in the last two, three decades, I think there's been more of an effort by many writers who come from different regions and grew up speaking their own dialects, putting that into uh, dialogues or even in the entire narrative. You know, there, there are very accomplished writers like Hassan Azizul Haq, Akhtar Zaman Ilyas, and many others who have done that in their writing. I personally am, to be honest, not a big fan of uh, putting a whole lot of dialect into uh, literary text because I feel that it can also be a little obstructive to people who are not too familiar with that, that dialect. You know, it demands a lot of them. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, it's the individual author's choice, but an author making that choice then should also be respectful of any reader who makes the choice that I'm not ready for this much work. So it, it goes both ways, and then one has to handle it, uh, I think, uh, based on what one's goal is or what one's point is in using that dialectal form. Still have five minutes of time. If there's anybody who would like to ask a question, yeah. Uh, given mankind's close association with language and all other related capacities, would it be safe enough to say that human beings have altered the evolution of languages? For example, Bengali has been very important for your aesthetic growth. What conscious steps can those who engage in literary discourse take to understand the evolutionary pressures that each language faces and encompass those in our writing? Do you want to take it first? Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I got the question right. You're asking that, you know, given the 
supreme importance of language in human experience and even in the evolution of cultures, not just individual but collective experience. Uh, what kind of awareness does the writer bring or should bring in being aware of the uh, history of evolution and even its uh, current or possible future directions? What, how conscious are they uh, while they're writing? Sorry, couldn't hear that. How could they become okay. more conscious of the process? Um, first of all, as you know, someone who's written only two books and uh, is still a beginning writer or whatever you want to call it, far be it for me to comment on behalf of all writers. But uh, for myself, I would say, uh, I don't know, first of all, that writers are actually uh, necessarily such, uh, you know, enlightened or moral beings that they will take on great causes on their shoulders. Uh, this might not be a popular thing to say and maybe my other writer friends will not uh, like my saying this. I, I personally suspect that writers are actually quite defective beings and that's why they have this tr tremendous craving to uh, sort of, you know, say these things, you know, dress it up nicely, hide the fact that what you're really trying to do is settle scores, get attention. So, you know, how much can you expect uh, from a breed of people who are, first of all, given to such lowly propensities? But having said that, definitely a certain awareness of language and consciousness of it is what um, is, is very much, I think, part of uh, the writer's trade, writer's craft, and in most cases, especially literary writers who are dealing with language and make a lot of, you know, conscious choices of what kind of language they're using. And they may even change or, that uh, uh, use uh, a lot depending on the particular work they're doing, the particular kind of audience they wish to address. Um, but I think for a literary writer working within these creative forms of fiction or poetry or plays, uh, you can use these forms in the service of the language. But for me, for example, since my first passion is to tell a good story, to work with the form of fiction, I really subject language to the needs of the form. I think we're out of time. I, we do have time for one last question, but uh, if, there's, if there is a question. All right. Could so I, I think that with that, Could yeah. I add to what sure, 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 sure. Now, you know, if, if you're talking about, con I think as I understand it, you're talking about the conservation of language. Now, from our part of the world, I think I would take a different perspective because for every writer that comes onto the scene, he's also contributing towards the conservation of the language. And uh, this is something that uh, every writer in every regional writer in the Northeast is very aware of, that if he doesn't write, if he or she doesn't write, that language is going to be lost because we have so much in the oral which has, which has yet to be recorded. And this is the reason why there are a lot of people who are making an effort to um, to translate, there's also this act of translation from what exists uh, in, uh, in art form, in the oral form, into the written form. And so language is something that plays a very important role in our communities in the Northeast. I think on that note, uh, we're going to come to the end of the day's proceedings. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for a very, very interesting session. Thank you, Faiza, for the introduction. And um, with